What happened before was that even if a company was progressive, and I went out to Silicon Valley actually and did research on this and looked at Google, I went to a couple of companies out there and what they had done was the ones that were successful had designed you know, quiet spaces, places for people to have small groups of conversation. The ones where it didn't work is that those became like storage rooms. You know, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't maintain it. So my advice would be to have options for people. This is the Workplace Therapist Podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. Um, and the, if you haven't heard and of our new tagline, the entire purpose of the show is one singular thing, and that is to help you improve your conversations and relationships at work. And, and that makes this topic for this week so much more relevant because we're going to talk about introverts and more importantly, how do we create introvert friendly environments and workplaces? So we're really leveraging that element. I think we're so focused on extroverts and we, we tend to cater to that group. How do we really bring in all the gifts and talents of introverts? And so to help us on this journey, I've got my good friend and colleague who's a returning guest, Jennifer Conweiler, to help us on this journey. So Jennifer, first of all, before I um, share a little bit more about your titles and background, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh my gosh, I, I was so happy to get the invite once again. The return guest is a real honor right. and, on your show. And you just brought out, came out with a new book. Which is well, which you. is like amazing because it's it is the topic of our conversation today, yeah. creating introvert friendly workplaces. Right. So, so this right. is your this is your fourth book uh, around is. the topic. Actually, my fi- it's my fifth book total, but the first book was on a, a different topic. It was on HR, yeah. shaping your yeah. HR role. That was my first book, but then the four most recent books are on this yep. topic that I that I love so much: introverts at work. And so, so not only are you a best selling author. You're a certified speaking professional. You're a speaker. You go all around the world and speak on these kinds of topics. You've got your PhD. Um, what else about you sh- should the listeners know? What should they know about me? Well, I'm thinking about something that's happening right this week. You know, that, that's happening as we talk. My mom is going to be 100 years old this week. Wow. <laughs> that's something that I've never, i not shared with a lot of people lately. But she was born July 12th. 1920 and we're going to celebrate up in new york well we're not going to new york but we're going to have a zoom celebration and uh some family members will be up there and she's the most humble resilient person in my life so i'm very i mean i've never even known a person that's 100 and it's my mom so very exciting how exciting inspiring uh and 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 and, you know we talked about the show but the beginning of the show how i've been talking a lot about um at least during this time of doing recordings from my home office about something positive yeah. or happy going on in our life. That's super positive and happy. I mean, what what a nice, nice positive thing in the world today. That's, that's it is, really it great. It is a joy. And she's the funniest person, Ren. And you, you, she's still laughing. I think that's a key to living longer. <laughs> I think so, too. Of course, good genes help, too. Yeah. But, you know, she every time you call her, she laughs. You oh, know, that's it's really uh, very inspiring. And she has what we call these Lou Laws, which I think I'll write a book about someday, which are, she's Lucille is her name, Lucille Boritz. I'll do like they do on the Today Show, Willard, you know, <laughs> I should have sent it in to about mom. But she has these Lou laws, these, you know, like one, if they move to California, they don't come back and, you know, things like that. So <laughs> we, I think there's a book there. What can so, I so say? Little, so both kind of funny life lessons, but also yes. kind of how she lives her life too. It sounds like a how little she, combination. Exactly. And most of them actually end up being true. So nice. she was, a, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by strong women in my life, both in my family and, and mentors throughout my life. And mom was my first one. So th- th- kind of an interesting segue into our conversation today. So even as mm-hmm. I experience you today, I wouldn't necessarily say, gosh, Jennifer, you're an introvert. Right. In, in fact, I would probably say you're more of an extrovert. That's right. Uh, um, and, and you write, right. And, and you write <laughs> about that in your book. You know, you write yeah. about that in you your book. About and that. That, and exactly. that. And that, that really, so maybe that's a good pivot point. Tell us a little bit yeah. about Um, So I've got two questions for you to kind of start our conversation today. Tell us what got you um, curious about Mm -hmm. introverts and kind of bringing that really to the spotlight Um, and then define introverts for us. I think that's probably a good, a good starting place. Sure. 
Well, I'll start with the second question. Introverts are people that tend to uh, really want to recharge their batteries after being out in the world and being with people. It's not like they don't like people. They just need more time and space to embrace the silence and take the quiet. So that's really the definition of the introvert. I learned about this early on when I was married to my husband, who I'm still married to, Bill, and I didn't quite get him. I didn't know why he would go off after social occasions to his man cave or Actually, back then, it was the other side of the apartment. <laughs> and I was very confused and frustrated. And what did I say? And what's wrong? I said all the things that you're not supposed to say to an introvert. <laughs> it gets them very upset when you do that, right? But I learned, I was fortunate enough to then take what a lot of instrument that a lot of us take, the Myers-Briggs, and learned about introverts. And I learned about extroverts. And then as I started to segue into the workplace, I found that this knowledge was very useful to me in supporting my clients there. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you've really been uh, really going down this path of trying to bring out this element of diversity and inclusion in the world. And how do we kind of bring yes. introverts more into those conversations, leverage their gifts and talents? Um, and so I think your book is really about kind of tools for doing that. Uh, so, so at a high level, what are some of those gifts and talents that you find that ent introverts possess that we really need to kind of nurture and kind of create space for? Yes. There are so many, but deep reflection, calmness, preparation, which is a real ace in the hole for introverts, uh, take, being able to sit in quiet so that they can go deeper and come up with those innovative, creative ideas. And another one that comes up a lot is engaged listening. Hmm. Engaged listening, really being able to be with somebody when they're with them. And people often tell you that the introvert might not say a lot to them, but they figured out their problem by talking with their introverted colleague or their teammate. So all those sound like amazing gifts that, that not only would we want in a coworker or a colleague or direct report, but frankly, I think I would want in a leader. Totally, totally. And that was my first book, The Introverted Leader, where people thought it was an oxymoron when I first told them about it, Brandon. You know, I wanted to look at all of these leaders that, we, that don't get enough credit you know, in our lives. And we think back about the people that had great influence on us, no matter what le kind of leadership position they were in, many of them, in fact, perhaps a majority of them had that quiet, calm demeanor uh, and that steadiness that really is attributed to the introvert. So we now do talk about introverted leaders. And the, the cool thing is in this journey, you talk about the, the current work that I've got. And what I've seen happen is as more awareness has come into the world, you know, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, you want people to understand differences uh, so that we can take a look at our own biases. There's been tremendous bias against uh, introverts and people weren't, were unconscious about it, just like a lot in a lot of elements of diversity. So why is that? Why have we not been embracing the introvert style and approach as much as we should or could? Well, if we say we, it's really more like Western society. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, in, in Asian society, we have more of like a collectivist kind of a mindset. So uh, it, it's actually embraced to not be the person who's the shiny uh, star. Or, or the, in Australia, they actually call it the tall poppy. You heard of that, the whole tall poppy syndrome. You don't want to stand out. Whereas that's the opposite in, in the United States. So there are, are real cultural differences. Uh, but in, in Western society, in our type A kind of extroverted workplaces, uh, the introverts get lost oftentimes. Mm. And that, that's what's really motivated me on this journey. And, you know, my focus is the workplace to see what it's not just a nice to have, Brandon. I mean, it's really about losing so much potential talent, ideas, innovation. You know, all of the research now talks about diversity. There's no there's no doubt that there's a strong correlation, if not a causal impact on uh, the performance of organizations. And you and I both work in that space, and I would imagine you would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. One of the terms you used in your book, which I thought was really, uh, really telling around that was loudership. Not leadership, yes. loudership. Say a little bit more about loudership. Yes, yes. I was shocked when I, you know, was doing uh, some due diligence before a program that I was doing in a company, and I interview maybe three to five people to find out a little more about the culture. And this term kept coming up. They said, well, Nobody really says it aloud, but we all know it's one of those sort of, you know, urban or those cultural themes that go around the company. And we don't call our, we don't talk about leadership. We talk about loudership. 
And to me, that said it all. It's like, yeah. who, are, who are we giving permission to, right? It's the people that are the, the talkers, the shiny, the more charismatic, the outgoing, the you know, backslappers. Uh, and they're the ones who get a lot of the attention. And again, unconscious bias, there might be incredible people that you're looking at for promotions or for hiring who could really make a difference, but because they're not as visible and as outwardly you know, extra, extroverted, <laughs> then uh, they get passed over. So that's that's why we really need to highlight these differences to show how important they are to, to become aware of and understand them. So I wanna take our conversation really down three paths today. So I wanna start with kind of um, what we as managers can do when we're interacting with introverts. How, how mm -hmm. can we have better interactions? I have a lot of clients that um, one of their guilty uh, challenges that they've gotta overcome is they're not comfortable with silence. So they, yes. they, they talk too much. So I want to talk. Right. I want to talk about the individual level. Then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of um, environments that you think is are, are creating good environments and spaces for that, that are introvert friendly. And then I want to land the plane with something I'm very passionate about that I've quoted you on regularly since our last uh, time Ooh. together, which what is did I say? which, which what did is I say? which is how do we run better meetings that are introvert yes. friendly? So as a good yeah. mentor of mine says, we all hold a piece of the truth. How do, you, how do we run meetings so we can pull out those pieces of the truth from our introvert colleagues as well as our extrovert colleagues? So yeah. I, wanna, I wanna spend the end of our time on that one. So maybe um, as a starting place, let's start with kind of the individual manager. What are some mm -hmm. things that, as you kind of heard my example of uh, some of those clients that just don't like silence and they try and they, and they over talk, um, what are some things that managers or leaders can do that will help them engage with introverts better. Right. Well, change does start within. It, it really does. And so uh, it, rather than just slap on tactics and tools, every leader needs to look within and to say, what's not, you know, where are my opportunities to, uh, to improve? And if you're constantly interrupting and constantly filling that silence, you're not going to hear from half the people on your team. So it really does a start with you and to sh shine the lens on you and do the whether you need to get coaching or feedback from your team and keep asking for feedback and for uh, going within doing your assessments, the kind of things you you could talk with your clients about Brandon all the time. So self reflection is number one. Um, and, and number two, I, you know, my talk about very, very practical tactics. I've had leaders who who say to me, particularly extroverted ones, that they'll actually put in place a numbering system in their head. So they'll go, well, either I'm going to let in this meeting, I'm going to let four people speak before I interject. You know, mm. I'll respond non-verbally, but I'm not going to respond verbally. Or they'll say, I'm going to count and breathe, which helps all of us, by the way, uh, three and count to three. You know, we're talking about very basic kind of uh, coaching or cues that we give ourselves. And that can make a real difference. And then after a while, it becomes, you know, just a, a matter of course and, and how we integrate all of these things into our leadership style. Because the good leader flexes, right? Because when they're talking with an extrovert, uh, what's going to really work for that person might be even, have you ever seen extroverts interrupt each other? Yeah. That's how they communicate. Yeah. They tend to communicate that way. They don't take it personally. But that's not what you do with an introvert. You're going to just cut them off. They're going to get unfocused. And so it's, it's important to self-awareness and then to start to look at what tools I can do and try them on, see how it works. I once heard someone describe leadership as the process of going from self-awareness to self-management. And I think you just kind of laid that out perfectly. Oh, it's beautiful. It was a, that self-awareness to self-management and using cues like really being thoughtful about, you know, um, mm -hmm. waiting for other people to speak or counting a certain number before you speak and creating more yeah space and, for and one, other voices. A very cool. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> An extrovert getting in there. Um, I interviewed a number of very successful introverted leaders who I like to go to, and a couple of them were in HR. And one of them uh, talked about, several did, but I'll pa pick this one person, Pat Waters, who relates to that other question you talked about with meetings. And Pat um, has gone her own, through her own journey. And the introverted leaders who you speak with will talk about the struggles, you know, whether it's Doug Canone or Pat Waters or people that are very known in, in the HR world, et cetera. They will, um, they will tell you about the struggles that they had early on. And then they talk about how they overcame those. And then whatever tactics or tools, and again, they're usually very practical kinds of things, like Pat going to your meeting question. Uh, Pat has advised, and she coaches 
other introverts because she wants to see them succeed within her own organization. You know, she'll say, I was told by a coach once that if I self-censor myself, three times, if I kind of hear, have a thought and I don't share it, and I might say, well, this isn't fully baked, but I'm going to share it, then it's not going to come out into the world, right? It's not going to come out into the meeting. And so I need to discipline myself to just say it, to land it in the room. And she said, just sharing that kind of a tip that's very practical helps the other introverts. So in summary, the leaders who are introverted play a very pivotal role in modeling and coaching there are introverts on the, in their companies. That's beautiful. So there's not only things yeah. that we can do as leaders to create space, but we can also, yes. whether introverted or extroverted, do some encouragement to try and help cre- create some level of comfort for introverts to throw out maybe something that's not perfectly finished. Uh, and to that's ju- right. Just to continue, right. to continue the conversation. Get uh, it in there. And and that's not the only thing that you do. Introverts play to their strengths. You know, they will will encourage people too to ask for pre the pre before the meeting, what's the agenda? We've talked about that. Afterwards, if you have more thoughts, you intro, introverts like to go deeper and like to share through writing, share it after the meeting with the team. You know, so again, use your strengths, encourage writing throughout the meeting itself. There I have many tip, tips in the book that that kind of give you ways that introverts can shine, but also be heard. Yeah, you really, so. you're, you really do. So we're going to move into break. When we come back from break, uh, we're going to move into my second kind of area for us. And we're going to talk about creating environments and spaces for introverts. And specifically, I want your perspective on open workspaces. Yes. Are they friendly okay. or unfriendly to introverts? <laughs> And I, I know you you've got a point that. of view on that. So um, stay tuned. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Certainly my, my folks do. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to the show. In case you haven't heard, Brandon's got a new book out. He's going to tell you all about it. Thanks, Emily. So the book is The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in a World Where Everything is Urgent All the Time. And if you're like me and like most of us, everything does feel urgent all the time. It's like hot sauce is being poured on everything, whether it's our work life, our family life, coming from our clients, coming from our boss. And so the book is a practical guide on how do we manage urgency. Not only how do we set proper boundaries, but how do we properly create urgency when we need to. So I wrote the book for you. I can't wait for you to get a copy. Thanks, Brandon. Don't forget to check out The Hot Sauce Principle, available now on Amazon.com. Back to the show. Welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Workplace Therapist Podcast. And um, before the break, we were talking about, I had my wonderful guest, Jennifer Conweiler, and we were talking about um, introverts and how do we create um, better conversations with introverts. And I teased Jennifer going into break. Um, now I want to move into our second topic, which is creating environments which are introvert friendly. And there's all for the last, I don't know how many years now, at least 10 years, there's just been this yeah. push for this open workspaces and how amazing mm-hmm. it's going to be. Bring everybody in and how everyone's going to love it. And it's just going to be great. So what's your perspective on open workspace? Is that is that introvert friendly? Uh, and, and, and maybe it's not a yes or no. Maybe there's a gradation yeah. in that. But I would love your thoughts around that. Yeah, there, let me give you both sides of it. And it's interesting the lens we find ourselves in now as you know, as we move back and um, into different kind of workspaces. Um, I did a survey of over 240 uh, introvert, mostly introverts, uh, Brandon, and uh, the, the most passion came around, you wouldn't be surprised, around meetings and workspace, the open mm. workspace. There was such, um, I have to say the comments were really uh, angry and just frustration just seeped. I could just see them seeping off the page. In fact, uh, in terms of the statistics, we had um, um, uh, the 34 percent only said that their workplace culture supports introverts and extroverts and only 35 percent evaluated the workplace environment as being supportive. And so what people were very concerned about, as you can imagine, it was privacy. It was noise. It was just space. It was uh, those kinds of things, a sensory intrusion, Mm. not able to do work. And what I learned in doing the research, it was quite interesting that there are three basic uh, parts of work that we want to look at when we're designing an environment. And that's around collaboration, 
It's around socialization and focus. So if you think about that, uh, if the introverts are not feeling like they're getting that kind of time to focus, you know, we're losing a lot there and they're frustrated. Now, let me give you the positive side of it, which I was, it was kind of really surprising to me as I did more research, I delved into a couple of companies that said it wasn't so bad that they were surprised that when they shifted in one case to an open office, they found it uh, not so terrible. And, and what didn't they find terrible about it? They found that they were collaborating more. Now, some of the research, again, goes against that and says that when people are in an op open office, there's a couple of studies that say that they uh, don't do that. They actually email each other more than, than you know, when they're right next to each other, which we've all experienced. But these people said, you know, if somebody would walk by sort of extemporaneously and just mention something, um, or they'd overhear a conversation, which happens a lot, and that gave more context to their own mm. work. And they were actually able to contribute. They also developed relationships uh, with people through natural mingling. And, you know, Steve Wozniak, to use an older example, but with Pixar, actually designed the building so that people had from different departments had to intersect on their way to the kitchen and on the restrooms, in the restrooms. So I yeah. think he was into, onto something there. So we have to still, I think, figure out a way to still get that engagement. And it can't all be necessarily through virtual means, you know, but um, so introverts can thrive as well. Okay. I'm going to ask you a super unfair question. What's that? And here it is. So coming out of COVID, if yeah. I look in my crystal ball, I think people are going to be reevaluating their commercial real estate. And, yeah. and because they're going to say, gosh, we don't maybe need quite as much as we had before. And some of this virtual mm -hmm. working from home works. So yes. if, if people yes. do go down that path, like I think we might agree that they, they likely will, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. would you advise them on workplace design? Should it be open? Oh. Should you have offices? Should you have a hybrid? What, what kind of guidance would, might you give? Well, a part of it's going to depend on health and safety. So you're, we're seeing things come out now about about spacing and numbers of people and you know how we have to have people in hallways walking different ways so some of that's going to really drive drive this but we have to figure out a way maybe it's not in the conference room but in a big open space use that space where people are who, are, who used to be there or home you know to have those sort of discussions and that collaboration i talked about to yeah. have some space to focus because what happened before was that even if a company was progressive, and I went out to Silicon Valley actually and did research on this and looked at some Google, I went to a couple of companies out there and what they had done was the ones that were successful had designed you know, quiet spaces, places for people to have small groups of conversation. The ones where it didn't work is that those became like storage rooms. You know, They, yeah. didn't, they didn't maintain it. So my advice would be to have options for people and while we're talking about remote work, you know, I think the research is really out on that as far as uh, it's important to offer that option to give people aut autonomy. It's very positive for introverts, but it may not be five days a week. You God, know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like we're doing with schools, maybe talking about them part time coming in. So there is still that connection that that not just virtual five days a week because the, the research i did on remote work was that it was extremely positive for introverts they felt and extroverts actually commented as well yeah. they felt it to be extremely uh, satisfying and productive but yet too much of a good thing can be a weakness so, can, can really you know get people off track so what i'm hearing is some kind of a mix some kind of a mix of virtual and, and, and in person and in the in person create some options in those spaces, both options yes. for open communication and collaboration, but also small room breakouts and discussions. Right, and here's, and I agree, yes, you, you encapsulated that very well as a good introverted engaged listener <laughs> did. Here's the thing that we're missing a lot of the time. We don't ask introverts. So you, you can ask me, and I'm, you know, I consider myself a champion, an ally, an advocate. I've had a lot of experience in this area. But it's not up to me. It's up to the introverts in your company to give you feedback. And you ne we need to go and talk with them and survey them and say what works for you. Because for too long, we decisions have been made so, so much of the time without considering that, that now is the chance to simply ask, ask them to weigh in. And introverts are getting more organized in organizations too. There's becoming part of employee, there's forming their own employee resource groups. 
they're speaking up more as there's more education about this this topic. So ask your introverts. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Uh, well, I, I, before we run out of time, I've got to get into the meeting question because that's something that folks I talk to as I bounce around the world are so intrigued by is how do I run better meetings yeah. that are going to work better for everybody and let everyone put some kind of input on the table, mm -hmm. not just, you know, the two or three extroverts kind of fill, using up all that airtime. So right. you had, yeah. we won't get I to all of them in there. here. They, they, you have 13 amazing tips in the book. Oh, you. And so I didn't make them all up. I, you know, I learned about them from successful meeting facilitators. And that's what you do need to have. You do need to have a somebody who plans. You can't just wing meetings, you know? You really have to give some thought to it. So I Did you have a favorite of the 13? No, there's so many. So I I'm I'm going to pull a few. Oh, Brandon, you you're you I'm so I'm blushing here. Well, there really are a lot of great <laughs> ones. So I think, I think part of it is, you know, you, you don't say this explicitly, but it, it's implied in here that we don't want to wing meetings. You really want to have a clear agenda and you might even, you have number two is hand out pre-work with questions. So talk a little bit about that. Why is that, that helpful? Came from, yeah, that came from an, excuse me, an introverted leader who thought, you know, I really need to give people the chance to think because that's the sweet, another sweet spot of introverts. If they have a chance to just simply prepare and think about what their comments are, you're going to get so much more rich answers and you will from the extroverts as well. So putting in structures like that, we have a one minute rule, I think, and there are one minute report out. Yep. Everybody goes around. I want to hear from everybody. What's your comment? Tell me what your thoughts are on this. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of tips that all came from people that were very good at facilitating the engagement. And I would say remotely now, virtually, we have some special challenges and I don't just say now it's going to happen as we go forward, but we also have some incredible opportunities and one place we're missing the boat. And I, I really encourage leaders to do this is to really utilize your chat function because mm. they'll say, Oh, I throw out these questions and nobody says anything. Well, yeah, nobody says anything because it's, you know, people are embarrassed. They're sort of like on camera. They don't, you know, it's, and that's another thing, don't always require cameras to be on, but utilize the chat, put some questions in there, ask people to comment, then take the comment out. If it's one that you wanna just, you're just kind of scrolling them and say, you know, Brandon, could you tell us a little bit more about that? I just want a little more clarity. Here's what Brandon said. So you give him some prep time and, and then you have introduced his voice in the room perhaps. So you know, you're kind of segueing that. You know, hearing you say that, it's striking. I'm, I'm thinking back to a, a group of R&D leaders that I had been working with. 25 R&D leaders, all, yeah. all kind of engineering backgrounds, all mm -hmm. introverts, and they loved the chat function. Love, love, loved it. I mean, and they were having a little banter with each other. Um, That's right. And, that is exactly and, right. And, and it was so other. it was so much fun. They were, you know, it was just I mean, it was just constantly scrolling the entire session. They weren't talking, but the chat was just lit up like a lightning bolt. It was crazy. And and your role as a facilitator to pay is to pay just as much attention to the chat if you can, or have a have a second person doing that if you you got a larger meeting. Uh, but give credence to the chat because they are expressing themselves in there. And that's a real opportunity for us to engage introverts. There was one other, one of my favorite techniques is the buddy system. I was going that, that, to, that, that's number, like that? number four. I was going to go to that one next, pair up. I think that pair was brilliant. Up. I think that was so brilliant. So say a little bit more about that. And this came from, um, also from Pat Waters, who's, a, who's a, just a stellar HR introverted leader. She, she learned that there were people who were remotely situated and then we had, you know, the, the in-person meeting. And this is what it emerged from. And you know how we forget about those people. It's just natural. You're like, oh, there's people out there. Oh, yeah. Hi, hi, hi. And then we forget unless then they have to speak on the speaker phone or, you know, make their voice known. And so what she did, she paired up people with uh, folks who were out in the field and she would have the people that were in the meeting, the live meeting chatting with their buddy. She called it their buddy. And that buddy might be more introverted. They might have English as a second language. So things were going really fast and they might have been a little confused. And that buddy was clarifying things, was also throwing questions into the room that that person was asking and also making a nice segue for them to then speak and ask him, would you be OK sharing now? You know, kind of getting them ready. And it works beautifully. It works beautifully. So that's something you guys might want to think about.
I think that's a brilliant idea because it really helps to, it does a lot of things. It helps with the yeah. meeting, but it also helps build that relationship because exactly. now it's like, I'm looking out for you and you're looking out for me. Mm-hmm. And it's just, if we feel more of a connection, so you get, you get collaboration, you, you yes, got, Brandon. you got trust. You've got some of those things that we, you know, really want to have beyond just the meeting. So I think exactly. it's, I think it's exactly. brilliant. You know what we, I, and we've talked about the ally and the advocate role now a lot within the realm of diversity. And that's a beautiful example of it. It's like speaking up for people who aren't maybe a little timid to speak up for themselves and representing them. And I've experienced it as a woman in meetings when I've been in a male dominated situation. And I know how good it feels when I've had somebody who's been maybe an informal buddy who'd say, you know, I think Jennifer really has something to say now. You know, let, we need to listen to her when I've been talked over. Let's hear Jennifer's point. I mean, that's what an ally does, an advocate. They bring that voice into the room. And I know how good that feels because it's it's almost impossible to do that yourself. Mm. Yeah, that's right. So one, I know we're getting close to the end here. When you think about that role of kind of ally, um, is it okay to have that person assigned or do we need to have volunteers or what, the, how does that, should that role be anointed or should you kind of anoint yourself or a little bit of both? Well, the ideal is if you, you anoint yourself, but you have to be careful that you're not, you know, you don't want to get into a condescending kind of, oh, I need to help you poor introvert. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. It's like, I've noticed the last couple of meetings that you've had, I know you've had some things to share and you haven't. So here's an idea that we might want to work out. You could share with them maybe a way to get to work together to do that. Um, But I think, I really think that all of us can surface this introvert bias and really, no matter extrovert, introvert, speak up for people who are quieter and don't necessarily feel comfortable doing that. And then they're so grateful when you do, when you highlight them, when you share their information, uh, when you talk about them and advocate for them. I mean, there's nothing better in terms of a structured program, uh, I think that can work. I'm not as positive about that in, just from my experience in mentoring mm. in organizations. I think they can work, but it usually works better when it's a, a really encouraged in the culture and there's, a, there's really a, a reinforcement of that, uh, yeah. but not necessarily structured and so, you know, so, so may, maybe in the smaller team environment, you know, where you give the example of, you know, you may pair people up uh-huh. you know, that are on your team, that might work versus a formal program that HR rolls out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, again, it goes back to let's talk with introverts one on one. The best leaders that I found and, and I write about this in the leadership chapter, um, we're always making an intentional effort to meet with each person on the team to understand what they needed and how to do it. And you may have remembered in there the user manual that I mentioned. Yep, absolutely. Um, This isn't a test on the book, but I love that. That came from Silicon Valley and it's kind of spreading now where people actually put their likes and their preferences and and then you talk about it as a team. So so I think it's gonna depend on the team and the discussion that goes on there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, so. this, this has been absolutely great. So I ask all my uh, guests this Thank final you. closing question, and it's the same one I've always asked with a little tweak. So what's one life hack you have for us to help us improve our either conversations or relationships, either at work or at home? This involves your phone, and my life hack would be when you're in a conversation and you finish speaking, try putting your phone on mute. Hmm and let the person talk. And this is specifically to the extroverts. It'll help you not, even if you are talking, the person's not gonna hear you. <laughs> and oh, it, interesting. you can probably do it too on, on uh, Zoom and on the other thing. But try the mute button, it seems to work very well. So if you really can't, if you really not just wanna talk, but you really wanna create space, just put the mute button. So you're still talking, but, they, they, but they're, they're hearing the silence, creating more but space. But you're trying not to talk. You're trying to say, okay, I'm gonna mute this now. So it's like a prompt and a cue to yourself that, okay, this is my chance. This is like an aid, right? To not speak because what happens much of the time and Brandy, you can tell me if you've experienced this, you've just paused for a moment and that other person thinks that you're finished. So they come right in, right? you know, for the kill. <laughs> they keep talking. So if you finish, have finished speaking, stop. But sometimes it's hard to stop. So use the mute button. That's beautiful. Well, Jennifer, if people want to buy your latest and greatest book, Creating Introvert-Friendly Workplaces, or learn anything else about you, where can they go? 
Well, go to my web. Well, the, the book is on all the, the major channels, including Amazon. If you like it, we always appreciate reviews. And I'm very involved. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, very much. I'm active there. And my website. We're launching a new website in a couple of weeks. I'm very excited about. It has a lot of resources. And do take a quiz. We have a new quiz called the Introverted Friendly Quiz and creating an introvert friendly workplace. And it's very short, but it'll tell you where you stand with your team. And then it'll be offer a, a springboard for discussion to figure out where you guys can, can improve and how you could do it. So okay, and I what, encourage and, you to take the quiz. And what is that website address? It's jenniferconweiler.com. Okay, so as and, long as you can spell my name, well, it, it'll be in the show now. Oh yeah, yeah K-A-H-N. Yep. <laughs> W-E-I-L-E-R, Jennifer. Yep. Yep. JenniferConweiler.com. Fantastic. That's it. Great. Excellent. Jennifer, as always, your gift. This was an amazing conversation. I look forward to our next one because this is such a uh, constantly evergreen uh, topic that is just always relevant. Um, well, so thank I, you. Brandon, for your time. I so appreciate your belief in this. You've always been an advocate. And uh, by you getting the word out, it's it makes a big difference. And I want to give you a shout out to the hot sauce principal. It's, it's on my nightstand, on my Kindle for this weekend, and everybody should buy a copy. Excellent. So now you're a part of the author club. Thank you. Thank Kudos you. Thank to you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank I, you so I, much. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching and listening to the show. Bye, um, everybody. Um, bye, Jennifer. And, of course, until our uh, next show, uh, have a great week and an awesome life. <laughs>